All right. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, thank you to everybody who's on the stream. I'm not sure where is the camera. So where do I look to greet people on the stream? Here. All right. Hello, people on the stream. Welcome to NDC Oslo. It's a little bit of a weird time, uh, as you know, but I'm really excited to be here. And uh, essentially, this session was not planned. Uh, but when I heard that the uh, organizers had some free slots, I said, well, you know, I had this session. I gave it actually last week at another conference, and I propose to give it again. So basically, you know, helping them and filling the slot. So welcome, everyone. My name is Laurent Bunion. I work for Microsoft uh, Azure. I'm a cloud advocate. And what we're going to talk about today is even driven applications in Azure. And specifically, we are going to talk about Signal R. Now, there are other ways to do even driven applications in Azure. Uh, you may have heard about PubSub. I'm not going to talk about that today. But just know that PubSub and Signal R are two ways to fulfill kind of the same things with some differences. So if you're interested in PubSub, check it out. Signal R is awesome, um, especially if you're using one of the client SDKs that is existing. And they exist in JavaScript, in .NET, and other languages as well. Uh, so it's really, it's really good. The demo we are going to see today is actually in JavaScript which if you ever, you know, if you know me from before, you might be surprised because I'm really more of a .NET guy. But at the end, I'm also going to show you a Blazor example. So basically a similar application, but built in, uh, in Blazor. All right, so the agenda for today, we are going to talk about uh, event-driven client application development in the past. Like, how did we do things? Uh, in, uh, you know, the first time that I used this type of, uh, of, uh, of patterns was probably around 2001, I would say. Uh, so back then, we didn't have sockets, we didn't have this kind of thing. So how did we do things uh, in the past, right? And then after that, we'll go into Signal R. Signal R is a, a service that we have. Uh, you might have heard about it in the context of ASP.NET. Now we are going to show you that Signal R can also be deployed um, as a standalone service on Azure in a serverless manner, and that is quite exciting because it really opens the door to many possibilities, right? And then after that, we'll talk about static web apps. So strictly speaking, static web apps don't have anything to do with even driven applications in Azure, but it's a really cool way to take um, what we now call SPA, right? Single page applications, and then to put them on Azure and then you can even have a backend, which is serverless, which is Azure Functions. And that's exactly what we are going to do. And then after that, we'll talk about Timekeeper. Timekeeper is an application that I developed, uh, which, uh, you know, I'm Swiss, so I like to keep track of time precisely. And this is really helping us to produce uh, the shows that we put on our TV channel, which is called Learn TV. At, uh, so if you go to uh, Microsoft.com slash Learn TV, uh, or ak.ms uh, slash learn TV, uh, you can see it. And we have shows there where we invite a lot of guests and we need those guests to be able to keep track of time. And so that's going to be uh, part of the demo. All right, so even driven applications in Azure. Um, first of all, let's go back in the past and let's talk about what we did before we had those possibilities. So one thing we were doing is polling, right? So you have a web browser, you have a server, and one uh, possibility to ask the server for information is basically to send a message, send a request. Okay, HTTP is a request response mechanism. And then after a while, you're going to send another request and maybe the server will tell you, I have nothing, or maybe it will say, I have something. And then after that, you're going to wait for a while and then you're going to send yet another request. And of course, there are a lot of problems with this approach. The main problem really is the latency, right? Because since you can only send messages from time to time, this is not at all a real-time situation. And you cannot send requests too often because that's going to overload the server. And of course, if you try to scale out and then you try to have way more clients, uh, this is really going to bring the server to their knees, right? Where uh, essentially, you open a lot of requests to the server, and, and that's going to consume threads, that's going to consume memory, and basically, this is not really good. So it's not a real-time experience at all. So very clever people had an idea to come up with something that they called Comet. Have you heard about Comet in the context of polling? No, this is uh, something which actually we still use today sometimes, uh, especially as a fallback when we have some really old web browsers. But comment the idea is that you're going to open a connection to the server, but then the server is not going to reply, 
until it has a response, until it has something, an event, okay? So you keep the connection open. And then two things can happen. Either the server suddenly has an event and then is going to reply and say, okay, I have something. Or the connection is going to time out, in which case immediately the client is going to reopen a connection. So you keep a connection open to the server at all times, okay? Now that works pretty well. It's kind of real time. But of course there are big issues with this way, with this approach, is that keeping a connection open is going to keep the server busy. Okay, that consumes threads, that consumes memory on the server. And again, if you scale out and then you have a lot of clients, you're going to, at the end, bring the server to their knees, right? And, and that doesn't work. Um, so this is an issue. <coughs> also, another issue is that in the days, uh, and back then uh, we had only two concurrent connections per web browser, meaning that a web browser could open a connection to a server and then it only had another connection for everything else. Okay, so if you were blocking a connection for this kind of updates, like updating your web UI, etc., that was causing an issue because then you had only another connection to go and, and, and get additional information, right? Like other HTTP, etc. So that's a big problem. Nowadays, I'm told that web browsers can support up to four connections, which is awesome. <laughs> but still, it means that you, you're blocking 25% of your connections with commit, right? So it's not a great scenario. And generally speaking, I would say it gave me always an impression of, well, it's not quite proper, it's not quite clean, all right? You know, this gut feeling you get sometimes. So this is where WebSockets can really help you, and they are basically a big change in the way that we develop web applications. WebSockets are not new. They are, in fact, celebrating their 10th anniversary. The RFC was, um, was published in December 2011. Okay, so exactly 10 years. Um, and the idea here is that you're going to negotiate over HTTP. Everything starts with HTTP. There is a, what we call a handshake. But then a connection will be open at a socket level, at a low level. And this connection will be kept open in two ways. So that allows the client to ask the server, but also the server to ask the client or to send information to the client. So it's what we call a full duplex communication system, okay, duplex being uh, in two directions. And the cool thing is that WebSockets these days are supported by pretty much every browser, including in the mobile, okay, including in, uh, in mobile phones. So this is pretty good. Notice that even Internet Explorer in, the, in this list, so when I'm talking about modern browser, it's in quotation marks, right? But Edge, you know, Safari, Firefox, Chrome, etc., all support that, also on, uh, on mobile. And there is also a way to secure your messages using what they call WSS, okay? So WebSocket Secure. Uh, so basically encrypting just like you encrypt in HTTPS. So that brings us to uh, Signal R, and Signal R is a way to handle WebSockets in a web application. And initially, it was developed for ASP.NET as a component part of ASP.NET, which meant that you had to deploy that to a web server. But now we have a possibility to deploy an Azure Signal R service as a standalone service on Azure, and that's part of the demo that I'm going to show you. I'm not going to ask you to read all that. I'm going to give you the slides at the end, so don't worry. But essentially what it says is that every time that you have a scenario where you have some high frequency changes, where you need to monitor a system, if you want to have a dashboard, if you want to handle some IoT events, uh, if you want to do some, some real-time high frequency polling in, in quotation mark, for example, think about an auction. Okay? In an auction, you need all your clients to be at the same uh, state immediately, right? Because if somebody wins the auction and another person doesn't know yet, you have a problem. Okay? So these kind of scenario are, uh, are interesting. A real-time location on a map, okay? on, a, on, on a web client, think about you know, uh, whatever map system you're using and then you want to follow your location, et cetera, et cetera. For this kind of scenario, SignalR is really good. Now, I already mentioned that, but basically, initially, SignalR was developed as a component for ASP.NET, which meant that you had to have a web server for example, an app service. It could be also your own hosted uh, ASP.NET server. And then you are deploying everything, which of course is a little bit annoying because it means that you have to maintain a web server. So that's not super ideal in many situations. 
which is where the Azure Signal R service is really interesting because you're going to deploy that as a standalone component. And then after that, you can have an Azure App Service connecting to it, but you can also have a static web application connecting to it using, for example, the uh, JavaScript SDK, or later we'll see also uh, using the .NET SDK uh, with Blazor with WebAssembly. Okay? So the way that it works, essentially you're going to have your web client, which is starting a connection with what I call here the app server. And app server is really loosely uh, termed. It can be a web server, but it can also be a serverless application, for example, a function application. And then this app server is going to open a connection to the signal R service. It's going to obtain connection information, like for example, a security token. It's going to get the URL of the service. And then it's going to give that back to the client. And then the client is going to use that information to open another connection to the uh, signal R service. And this is going to be uh, uh, what they call here a persistent connection. This is one of those web sockets connection, which is also a duplex connection in two directions. Cool thing about the app server, I already mentioned that you can deploy in that case, it's an app service icon. It can be also your own uh, hosted web server. It can be really any web server you want, but it also works with um, Azure functions. Uh, either in the demo I'm going to show you, I'm going to do, to do those functions in .NET, but you can also develop those functions in JavaScript, in Java, or in other languages that you have. Cool, so the good thing about Signal R and WebSockets in general, but Signal R in particular, is that there is a broad client support which means that uh, it, because it is based on standard, you have those SDKs that you can use, for example, in .NET, in JavaScript, in Java. So you can build your clients in different SDKs. And that is nice because it also supports mobile clients. Okay? So everybody, everywhere where those SDKs are running, basically you can use Signal R and connect to it from a, from a client perspective. So that can be Xamarin, if you do cross-platform application development with .NET. Nowadays, .NET MAUI would be the successor. Uh, native Java, okay, if you do native Java development for, uh, for Android, for example. But also Blazor, so .NET WebAssembly. JavaScript, which means that basically everywhere it runs, right? And uh, the whole SDK is based on REST. So basically, every time that you have something which supports REST, which is essentially every programming language uh, known to the face of the world, uh, you can uh, essentially use uh, Signal R. Okay. Now, another nice thing with uh, Signal R is that it is very robust. So you have a fallback scenario. So of course, they are going to try connecting using WebSockets. That's like the most efficient way. But if WebSockets don't work, there is another protocol which is called Service Sent Event. It's not very well known. It's part of HTML5, so it's a little bit old. But still, some browsers support that. So it's a possibility to have your server send some events. Uh, and if everything else fails, then they are going to fall back on Comet. So on the long polling scenarios that I mentioned. Now, of course, if you do that, you're going to introduce again the latency problem that I mentioned before. But it is better than nothing. Okay, so this fallback scenario, and that's really for very old web browser which really don't support WebSockets. Okay, and nowadays there are almost none. So it's good to know. Cool, so let's go <coughs> into the first demo. So for this demo, what we are going to do is build a chat server. Now, chat server is kind of the canonical application that you see when you see uh, Signal R demos. And uh, this is all good, and it works well to show it off. But I was not super satisfied with the demos that I found in the samples, because they were always using some uh, relatively complex JavaScript frameworks, and it introduced a level of, of complexity, which I was not very happy with. And also, I wanted to show basically how you can do a chat application like that using the Azure Signal R service, so having a serverless situation. And I really wanted my client to be one page of HTML and JavaScript with, let's say, 150 lines maximum. Okay, so that's what, I, what we are going to do now. All right, so let's go into Visual Studio. And by the way, everything I do in Visual Studio, you can, of course, do in other development environments, Visual Studio Code, etc. And we are going to start by creating the application server, what before was known as the application server. And here we are going to use .NET functions, okay? 
So I have a function application here, which is called chat server. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to start by adding a new Azure function. And I'm going to call this function negotiate. And again, here I'm using C Sharp, okay, .NET functions, but you can absolutely do that in JavaScript or in Java or in another language if you prefer. Now, this is going to be an HTTP triggered function, which means it's a function that is acting as an API if you want. It's going to be there, and then it's going to react to, a, to an HTTP request. Uh, you have different HTTP trigger that, uh, you have different triggers for uh, functions, but here this is one that we use quite frequently. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to create that. And this is the boilerplate code that I guess. But what we are going to do, we are going to start by saying, all right, this negotiate function, I'm going to return not a task of, and in fact, I'm, I don't even need to make it async. I'm going to return here a signal R connection info. Okay, oops. So signal R connection info is an object that comes from a NuGet package. And this NuGet package, if you go and check that out, it is here, microsoft.azure.webjobs.extensions.signalRService. Okay, now that's the server part of the signal R service that we are developing. Okay, it's still a little bit too big. Oh, I'm going to try to give you the best compromise here. All right, so I'm going to add here the namespace. And this uh, function is going to use get only. So essentially, I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to remove the post root here. And then I'm going to say the root for that. So the root is essentially the URI that you are calling when you call this is going to be negotiate. All right. Now, in order to make this work, I'm going to use a mechanism that we have in Azure Functions, which is extremely convenient, which is called binding. A binding means that I'm going to have a specially marked parameter in the signature of my function, which the runtime is going to populate. All right? And this is really convenient because it allows me to essentially say, just by the signature of the function, I want you to connect to a signal R server to get a hub or to create a hub if necessary, which is called simple chat. And then you're going to give me the connection info, which is essentially the URL of that hub and the token that I need to access it. Okay? And then when I get that, and by the way, sorry, this signal R service doesn't exist yet. All right, we are going to create it later. So at the moment, the, se the function is not going to work right now, but later when we create everything and we configure everything, that's going to work, all right? We will need a connection string for this to work. Good, so then what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove the whole boilerplate code here. And then this function is very simple. It's simply going to take the connection info from the signal R hub, and then it's going to give it back to the caller. So that is the negotiate part that we were seeing in the, in the workflow that we saw before, all right? Okay, so now we are going to create another function. And this function is going to be talk. Talk. And that's a function that my web client is going to call when it wants to send a message to all the others. It's going to be again an HTTP triggered application. But this time what we are going to say, we are going to say, all right, this is a post method. Okay, so I'm going to remove the get. And then I'm going to say, right, the, the root is going to be talk. So that's, again, the URL that we want to use here. Okay, now, in order for this to work, I'm going to use another binding. And this binding is going to be here, the signal R service itself. So I'm going to obtain it using, the, using this binding info. Again, the simple chat hub. And I'm going to obtain from there an iAsync collector. It's like a queue, if you want. All right? It's a queue of signal or messages. And what's going to happen is that every time I add a message to that queue, this is automatically going to be sent to the signal or hub. And then the signal or hub will broadcast that to all the clients. It's quite simple. So here, <coughs> what we are going to do, since this is a post method, we are going to have some, um, some payload. All right, so I'm going to put a quick try catch to handle errors. I'm going to read 
here the request, let's make that a little bit smaller, the request, which is going to be a JSON request from the body. And then in this request, I'm going to have a name, the name of the person who chats, and the text of the chat. And now I'm going to wrap this in a new J object. It's just a, a, a wrapper for, um, for JavaScript for JSON objects, really. Then I'm going to add this message to the queue. So you see I'm wrapping it into a signal R message. And then I'm giving this target. Now keep, keep in mind the target, because that's going to be important later. Okay? The target is essentially allowing me to have different actions based on that value. So for example, if I have new message, I will do something. If I have another tar target, I can do something different. So I can open channels within my hub, if you want. And by the way, I can also send messages with the same mechanism to specific recipients, if I want, or to a group of people. Okay? So people can also subscribe to a group, and then I can send that to them. All right, then when this uh, is all done, what I'm going to do is basically return OK, which is uh, you know, code for 200. Right. Good, so now at this point, if I was running this, this is going to fail, because I still don't know where my signal R hub is going to be. All right? So let's create it. To do that, we are going to go into, uh, into Azure. And here in Azure, I'm going to create a new resource. So there are different ways that you can do that. You can click here in the resource group. You can click here on Create a Resource. And then I'm going to choose here Signal R Service. OK? And in here, what I'm going to say, let's try to make that a little bit bigger. What we're going to say, it's always the same when you create services in Azure. You have to say which is the, subscri the subscription you're going to use. Uh, you're going to say uh, the resource group, like where do you want to put all your resources together. It's just like a logical grouping of resource. And then you have to enter a name. So I'm going to say test signal R. Now this is probably not going to work because I need my name to be unique because it's going to be a URL. So this is not great here. But if I add NDC Oslo 21, I'm pretty sure that's going to be unique enough. OK, so that works. Then I'm going to create here uh, this service in a specific region, okay, like everything. So I'm going to say here Western Europe. Like this, I reduce the latency because, of course, like I used to say, even at Microsoft, we still didn't solve the problem of going faster than speed of light. All right, we have tried, but it doesn't work yet. Maybe someday, crossing fingers. And then I can choose the pricing uh, tier, which uh, here I have free, which is for development or test, or standard. Now, those uh, tiers are different, but they're also quite similar. So in terms of connections, if you pay, you can open 1,000 connections per unit. And you can have as many uh, as uh, 100 units if you want. So that is 100,000 connections that you can open per, uh, per unit. Uh, no, sorry, 1, uh, 100,000 total, excuse me. And then you can have uh, up to 1 million messages per unit. So again, if you have 100 units um, and you have all those connections and you have all those uh, messages, it's really quite a large number of messages that you can send per day. Okay? Uh, in the free tier and in the paid tier, you have uh, an HTTPS uh, certificate included. So that includes SSL. And in the paid tier, we give you a guarantee that the service is going to be up 99.9% .9 of the time. So it's, uh, it's a pretty good SLA. All right, in that case, uh, I'm going to select here because in that case, it's not me who is paying, so that's cool. And here I can select also the unit count. You see, I can say how many servers, how many instances of the service do I want. And of course, you can change that at any time uh, if you want to scale up or scale, uh, uh, to scale out or scale in. And then the service mode, we are going to select here serverless. Serverless meaning that when I'm not using the service, I'm not going to pay for it. All right, it's, uh, it's like a consumption mode. So essentially, it is a way to optimize your, uh, your costs. Now, at this point, I'm not actually going to create the service because I already have a service, so I'm going to save some time. Instead, I'm going to go here and show you the actual service that I created. So this service here, and if I, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit because I want to show you, actually, is that necessary or not? Yeah. Uh, I just want to show you what we have here. So what we have here is different things, like, for example, the keys. 
And the keys are exactly what we need from the SDK to connect to the signal R hub. So that was kind of the missing point that I have in my client in my server application right now. I'm going to need those keys. Uh, of course, like everything in Azure, we also monitor those services. So if I go into the last 30 days, you see that here I had quite a lot of connections. This is probably last week when I was giving this demo to a slightly bigger room, and, uh, and people started using the service uh, that, uh, that I deployed to, uh, to chat. Okay, So you see that here I had more connections. So we monitor everything, and all those logs, all those metrics, etc., stay on the server so you can access them at any time, which is quite convenient. OK, in that case, I'm going to need the connection string. So I'm going to copy that. And then I'm going to go back here to my chat server. And in my local settings.json, so what is local settings.json? This is the local version of my settings. This is not going to go into GitHub. Okay? This is excluded by default. You want to have that in your Git ignore. Because this is where you can put some secrets when you develop locally. Later, when we go on Azure, we are going to have to reconfigure also this application. So when we deploy this application, we are going to have to say the same thing. Those secrets, typically, you want to put them into a service in Azure, which is called Key Vault. It's a, it's a service where you can have one admin, maybe two admins, right, who know about the service, who can manage your password. We are not going to do that in the demo, but that would be a good scenario. So here I'm local only. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to say, all right, let's add here a new value. The name is a convention between the signal R uh, bindings that we are using in the function and, uh, and here are the settings. And I'm going to replace this value here with the connection string that I just copied. I need to add a comma. Actually, it did it automatically. And the last thing that we are going to do, we are going to configure CORS. So here, my uh, function server, when I run it locally, it's going to be at localhost colon 7071. That's like the default port for Azure Functions or when you run in localhost. When I test my client application, I am going to have here a, um, a, a web server that I'm using, and I'm using here only locally for test purpose. When I deploy to Azure, we are going to deploy to a static web app, so we are not going to deploy anything from the chat server, from the, uh, from the chat client web here. We are only going to deploy the index.html. But here, for test purpose, I need a web server to basically run everything in local host. And that's going to be a different port. So if I want things to work, I'm going to have to go here in my local settings, and I'm going to just set CORS, where basically I say, all right, any port can access my uh, function application. Does that make sense? OK, it's just a way to uh, open the security just for local testing only. All right, so now at this point, if everything goes well, it should work. Famous last words. So I'm going to start that. OK, this is my chat server. It's configured as start uh, project. Now I have here a negotiate URL, which I can copy. It's a simple get method, so I can put that into a web browser. And now, OK, what is going on? I'm not sure why. Yeah, you know what? I did the same thing last week. That's crazy, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is a bad thing. So essentially what happened here, and thank you for noticing, my localhost settings of JSON was not valid JSON. So of course, the application failed when it started. And so I'm going to restart now my application. OK, here we go. And now if I go back here and refresh, now it works. So basically, I'm obtaining here the URL from my Signal R hub. And I'm obtaining also the token, which is going to allow me to connect. Now, note that this token is actually going to expire from time to time, right? So when you start your client application, you need to negotiate again. And if suddenly the application stops working, it's very simple. You press F5, you refresh. It's going to negotiate again, and then it's going to get a fresh token. That's pretty simple. So now we have the server side running. Now let's talk about the client side. And actually, why don't I let why don't I leave this application running? For the client side, like I told you, I want to have a very simple client. So it's a simple HTML page with, with a little bit of JavaScript. 
First thing I'm going to set is the base URL for my function. So here in that case, I'm running in localhost on port 7071. This is the information that I get here from my console, OK? Then I'm using Vue. So I'm going to define some CSS transitions. Vue is a very nice, lightweight JavaScript uh, framework that you can use if you want to do some simple JavaScript pages, HTML pages. And then what I'm going to say, I'm going to have a form. And in this form, I'm going to have an input. And notice that I am binding this input using the view binding mechanism to a view model property, which is called new message. So every time I update this value, it's going to be saved into a view model, which is a data object in JavaScript. And then when I press Enter, it's going to execute the send new message method, which is part of the view application. Now here, I have what happens when I receive a new message. So every time I receive a new message, it's going to be saved, and we'll see that later in the JavaScript, into this messages array. And for each message in here, and again, this is based on the view model mechanism on data binding, I am going to create here a new row with an HR, and then this D, which is essentially the, the data template for that row, if you want. And I'm going to bind to the name and to the text. And remember, this is in the talk here, I'm getting messages from the web client, which also have a name and a text. So I'm wrapping that into JSON, sending it. And then here in the HTML, I am unwrapping it and showing that to the user. Now I'm going to add the JavaScript packages that I need for all this to work. So I'm going to add view. I'm going to add the client part of Signal R, the JavaScript SDK, client SDK. And now I'm using also Axios, which is a lightweight HTTP client for JavaScript. So it's going to allow me to uh, send uh, REST calls. Then I have my view model, which is my data object. And remember the new message that we saw before, it was data bound, it's here. I have the name of the person. I have the list of messages. And through the magic of data binding, every time I add a message here, it's going to update the UI. And now I have this property ready, which I'm going to set to true when the connection is actually ready. Then I have my view application with a send new message um, method, which is executed when I press enter. It's going to call this, this function here. And then I'm going to start defining my uh, JavaScript function. So get, uh, get connection info is what is going to be executed in the very beginning when the application gets to life. It's going to call the negotiate function, the negotiate Azure function on my server. Okay, remember the API based URL that localhost 7071 slash API slash negotiate. And then it's going to use it's going to do that using the HTTP client. And then when it comes back. OK, this is an asynchronous mechanism. When it comes back, I'm going to return this data to the caller. Then I have another function, which is what's happening when the user sends a message. And you see it's going to take the text and the name, and it's going to send that to the talk function, the talk Azure function, using a post. Then I have what happens when I receive a new message. And we'll see later how the connection is configured for this to work. When I receive a new message, I want to take this message, and I'm going to add it into the messages array. OK? Unshift means I'm going to add it in the beginning, so that I have a reverse chronological order of messages. And uh, the, then through the magic of data binding, the UI will be updated. Then we are going to start the actual execution of the, um, uh, of the application. So I'm going to ask the username. And you see I'm using a good old-fashioned prompt. All right, I told you I want to keep things simple. That's what it is. Then after that, I'm going to get the connection info. Notice that this is a function call. This is an asynchronous function call. When it's come back, OK, this is the equivalent of await async in, uh, in .NET if you want. When it comes back, it's going to have the info. Inside the info, it will have the URL and the access token. And so with the access token, I'm going to create here a small factory that's just a way that sig signal R want to access the token. All right? And here, I'm going to use the hub connection builder function here, which comes from this JavaScript package that we added via NPN. All right? Here, we have a hub connection builder. And so in this hub connection builder, I'm going to say 
using the URL and using the token that I just obtained, I want you to build a connection. At this point, the connection is not open yet. It is just created. I'm going to configure the connection. And here I have this new message target. And so remember, new message is what I use here. When I send the message, I sent to this target. And so here, when I get this target, I'm going to execute the get new message function, which means that I could have multiple targets which, with multiple actions. OK, so that's quite convenient. And then finally, I'm going to start the connection. So at this point, my web application is ready to receive messages from the server. OK? Cool. So let's see how this works. I'm going to make sure that this is specified as start page. And then I'm going to run my web browser. And again, here I'm running a web browser purely for test purpose. Later, we will deploy just index.html to, uh, index to the, to the uh, static web app. So let's go and press Control F5. I'm going to enter my name, OK? And now it should be ready. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to open here another profile so that I have a totally different identity in here. And I'm going to paste. And here I'm going to call that the other Lohu. And now if I send hello world, it should work. And if I said here, how are you, it should work as well. Simple chat. Everything's running locally at the moment, OK? So the next step is to deploy that to Azure. How do we do that? Well, what we are going to do, we are going to use a static web app to do that, like I said. So static web apps are super convenient. I'm going to talk to you more about static web apps in a second. But right now, let's start with the deployment, because it's going to take just a few minutes to go through. So inside this, uh, this uh, resource group here, I'm going to create a new resource. Static web app. And I'm going to uh, give it a subscription, a resource group. And I'm going to give it a name. So let's call that NDC Oslo 21. Again, there is a verification because that will be uh, eventually part of a URL. Now, here I also have two plans. I have a free plan and I have a standard plan. But you see what's really cool? is that the free plan is also available for hobby or personal projects. So if you have a user group, if you have uh, you know, a, a community interest, if you are running some things for your local uh, group of Holly enthusiasts, for example, you can use that and you don't pay anything. That's pretty cool. You can have a whole blown, full blown website on it and you don't have to pay anything. Standard is for really production application. And if you want to compare the plans, the free tier is actually pretty generous. It's going to give you 100 gigabyte of bandwidth, which is the same in the paid tier anyway. It's going to give you two custom domains per application. So you can have www.mycommunityproject.com and then just my mycommunityproject.com, for example. But even better, it's going to include SSL certificates for free. And we are going to auto-renew those for you, so you don't have to worry. You're going to get HTTPS for free. Custom authentication is only valid, is only available in the paid tier. So I'm going to show you how custom authentication works. It's actually pretty cool because you can define some admins for your website. So if you have something which requires an admin, then potentially you're going to have to pay. Note that the paid tier is actually pretty cheap anyway. Maximum application size, 250 mega for the free tier, 500 for the paid tier. That includes everything, the images. If you have videos, you don't want to put them in there. You want to put them probably in a blob storage somewhere and then access it uh, via an HTTP connection. Staging environment, you have three staging environments in the free tier, 10 in the paid tier. Now, the way that staging works in static web app is absolutely awesome. What you do, and you're going to see that later, everything is driven by a repo. OK, so you're going, every time that you push to your main uh, branch in your repo, it's going to automatically deploy to your static web app. Very easy to use. But even better, if you open a new branch, and then you build some new features, and then you do a pull request, but you, you don't merge yet, you just open the pull request, it's going to deploy a staging environment in your static web app with a different URL. You're going to be able to test your feature. And then when you merge into main, it's going to deploy the new feature to your main production site, and it's going to delete the staging slot. So it's a very streamlined way to deploy things. 
And then you have Azure Functions as well. So the static web app is not just for your static web client, but it also supports Azure Functions on the server, so you can have an API that you can call. And here, everything is going to run in the same domain, so you don't have to worry about CRS anymore. Okay, everything, the, the whole authentication runs in the same web server, so this is pretty convenient as well. All right, so now I have to choose the region again, so I'm going to put it in Western Europe again, and then I'm going to say I want to deploy using GitHub or other, at the moment we also support uh, Azure DevOps. GitHub means I need a repo. So let's go to GitHub, and I'm going to create a new repo. I'm going to call that NDC Oslo 21. I'm going to keep it private. I could do it public. It doesn't really matter. And then I'm going to create my repository, copy the URL of that. And then if I go into the place where I created the code, which is uh, here in, where is it? Oh, I called it Dev Day Start. It's, uh, yeah, I should have called it NDC or Slow Start, but let's uh, keep it that name here. I'm going to right click and then I'm going to say um, create a. Wait, where am I? Uh, I need to make sure that I'm using the correct. Okay, so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go back here <laughs> and then I'm going to say open folder in File Explorer. It's going to be. Oh, here we go. It's just into single R function start. Okay. Sorry for the confusion, but basically this is, there is no repo here yet, okay? So I'm going to create a new repo. So let's go into show more options, and then I'm going to say create new repository. Now I'm using something which is called Git extensions to do that. You can of course do that from your command line if you prefer, from another uh, client or anything. Okay, create that, and now I'm going to say open the repository, again in Git extensions. And I'm going to commit, but I'm going to be quite selective of what I want to commit. So remember I told you I don't want to deploy the whole web server. I'm not interested in that. I'm only interested in the index.html. So why don't I go back into my folder? And in there, I'm going to say, I'm going to create another folder, just to be clear, which I'm going to call HTML. And then I'm going to take my index.html here. I'm going to paste it there. I really don't want the rest of the web server. And in here, I'm going to replace, if I open with Notepad++, I'm going to say, all right, now I'm not using localhost 7071 anymore, but I'm just going to give it an empty string. Why an empty string? Because everything is going to be running on the same server. I'm going to have my index.html served by the static web app, and I'm going the Azure function running in the same place, in the same domain, okay? So I don't need the domain name anymore. And now if I go back into my commit, going to refresh, so I'm going to take the git ignore. I'm not going to take anything from chat client web. I'm not interested in that. I'm going to take um, this chat server proj, the host, basically everything which is from the chat server, I need it, and plus the index.html. So I'm going to stage that. And then first commit, okay. Let's commit and push. I didn't configure the remote yet, so I need to do that. Or oh, geez. Origin, and somewhere here I have the name of this repo. Let's save the change. Do the configuration dance. All right, and now it's going to push the branch, yes. So now I have pushed all the files that I need to my repo, which means that I can go back into my static web app, and now I'm going to say, yes, now I'm ready to sign in with, uh, with GitHub. So I'm going to authorize the Azure static web app to act in my be on my behalf, all right, using my identity, which means that they have access to my organizations, they have access to all my repos. For example, the one that I just deployed, NDC Oslo. And they have access to the main branch. Then I'm going to say what build settings do I want to use. And here, notice you have Blazor. If you are building a web assembly, you can do that here. In my case, I'm going to use Vue.js. 
the app location, the index.html is inside the folder which is called HTML, and the API is into chat server. And then I'm going to remove that because I don't need it. Let's review and create. Create. Okay, it's going to just take a second to actually create the uh, application itself. So let's just wait for that. Okay. Once the deployment is complete, I can go to the resource. And then I can go and check what do I have in this static web app. Well, I have a static web app running, but I have nothing in it. What the framework actually did is that it went into my repo, and then it created a new GitHub action, which is now running, which is going to take my functions, build them using .NET, because it knows it's .NET. If I had function in JavaScript or in Java, it would build them using the different mechanism. It's going to deploy that. It's going to take the index HTML and deploy it as well. And then when it's ready, it's going to tell me, all right, hopefully it will be green and it will be working. So that's pretty awesome, right? Cool, that is going to take just a few minutes. So let's go back to the slides. And I'm going to give you a little bit more information about those static web apps. So static web apps might be my favorite service on Azure at the moment. All right, it's really cool what they did here. The way that it works is that, like I mentioned before, you're going to have, when you have a code change to a branch, it's going to use GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps Pipeline to basically build everything and deploy the right things. It's going to deploy the static content, HTML, JavaScript, CSS, images, but also WebAssembly, DLLs, if you have some. It's going to deploy the API using Azure Functions, and then everything's going to work, and you saw before you can have uh, SSL you can have a whole bunch of things. So again, I don't ask you to read everything here, but essentially the really cool thing is that you get your free SSL certificates. You can uh, configure custom domain names, all right? Uh, you have uh, the, the security model, which is really cool. It's role-based. I'm going to show you that when I show you the Timekeeper application. So basically you can say, all right, I have this person has a role which gives it access, which gives them access to, um, to a specific function set. And then another person has another role which is going to give, give them access to a different function set, etc. cetera. Uh, the staging scenario, I told you, if now I go to my repo and open a pull request on a different branch, it's going to set a staging environment for me. So that's really convenient, et cetera, et cetera. Very cool stuff. So at this point, hopefully, the deployment is complete. Not quite, but almost. Actually, we can go and check what's going on, all right? So build, deploy, job. Oh, you see, it just completed right now. So perfect, it's green, which means that if I go back here and refresh this, now it asks me to enter my username. Let's see if you follow. Is it going to work? Let's try. Ah, 500. What, what's happening? Well, what's happening is that I still didn't tell my function application where the signal R hub is. Remember, in the local host, I had a connection string. The local host is not deployed. That's not something you want in GitHub. Okay, this is a secret. Now I need to go in my static web app and I need to tell the static web app where is this secret. So let's do that quickly. I'm going to go here in my static web app. I am going to zoom down a little bit so that I see the sidebar. And here in configurations, I'm going to go back into my studio go into the local settings and I need the, the name of the value here and I need the connection string. Again, in a production scenario, you would probably do that, uh, put that into, um, into Key Vault, okay? But here, for the sake of the demo, I'm going to keep it simple. So now I have configured my, uh, my thing. What it means is that the Azure Function application is going to restart. Okay, but this is pretty seamless. You're just going to have to wait a few seconds. Now, if I go back here, let's refresh. Okay. And now this is a few seconds that I mentioned. The Azure Function application is starting, and now it is ready, which means that if I copy that, open in another web browser, let's paste. All right, the other logo. Does it work? Yes, it does via Azure. 
That's pretty cool. Now, I'm going to give you the possibility to test that. I'm going to copy this URL. And here I have a short link. I'm going to configure that. Here we go. And if you go, let me find my slide deck. If you go to this QR code, scan the QR code, that's going to open the client on your phone, all right? Everybody scan the QR code. Now we can go back to the web client. Let's give it a few seconds and please be chatting and hopefully that will work. Come on people, how long does it take to write a chat? Hey, look at that, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara, for taking part to the demo. Our Selbo, thank you, our Selbo, for answering. And if people are on the stream as well, please feel free. I'm going to put back the QR code here on the screen. Feel free to be chatting and to tell people uh, to tell people what you think about this demo. And you see that it works just fine. So I'm going to leave that application alive for a while. It doesn't work for you, really. So you have an interesting phone. I'm curious to see what you have. Come and see me after the after the presentation, okay? All right, so cool, and you see that, oh wow, it even supports emojis for, uh, for the username, which is pretty cool. Okie dokie, so I'm going to close this before somebody starts chatting some very naughty stuff. All right, we want to stay positive. And let's talk about Timekeeper. So Timekeeper is an application that I built to answer a question or a problem that I had. Uh, I'm not sure if you know who that fantastic individual is. It's uh, my friend and colleague, Abel Wong. I'm wearing his T-shirt now. Uh, Abel Wong unfortunately passed away uh, in July this year. Um, but just before he passed away, I had the chance to interview him for a series that I do, which is called Humans of Microsoft. And it's a small five-minute segment where I'm interviewing people, all kinds of people working at Microsoft, people like you and me, except they work for Microsoft. Um, and uh, it's really cool, but when you do this kind of interviews, you always have the problem, which is, how do I tell the person I'm interviewing that their time is up, because it's a five-minute segment, without interrupting them, which is rude. And I'm sure you hear that all the time on radio, right? Where on radio, people don't have a body language. They are not able to tell the interviewee hey, you should stop talking now because your time is up, right? So it's a little bit embarrassing. So again, I'm Swiss, which means I love clocks, all right? And the question was, how can I keep the time and tell everybody to keep the time without interrupting them? How can I keep them synchronized? And how can I also give them messages, right? When uh, people are presenting a TV show, very often they have a teleprompter. So it's a little bit the same scenario here. I wanted to have a teleprompter uh, feature. Then I showed that to my boss who said, oh, that's awesome, we should use that for the bigger show that we are doing Hello World. And then people started using it. And eventually we end up in a scenario where we are actually using it for a bunch of stuff. Shows on Learn TV, which is our, our, Learn, um, you know, our TV show on uh, Microsoft.com but also for other shows. Recently, I used it for .NET Conf, for example, when I was hosting .NET Conf. But we also use it for uh, internal meetings. When we have meetings where we have people who have a very short time, like two, three minutes, and we want to really keep them to the time, then we use that as well. So this is quite convenient. All right, so let's see how Timekeeper works. So first of all, let me show you. This is the instance that we are using in Azure. And here, it is very much the same instance than you saw before for the chat. With one difference, there is here role management. Because I wanted to avoid that people start messing up with the messages that we send to the presenter, or maybe stop and start clock. This is all client-based, which means that if people go and reverse engineer my DLL, my, my Blazor DLL, or in the worst case scenario, if that's JavaScript, they just go and they read everything, and then they know all my secrets. So you want to protect some roots. You want to make sure that when people want to start a clock, it's protected. In static web app, it's all supported. What you do is that you invite a new person. You can use Azure Active Directory, GitHub, Twitter, or in preview, we have Facebook and Google as well as uh, authentication providers. Then you enter, 
for example, their username. You say what domain you want to give them access to, and then you give them a role. And this role can be anything. In my case, I use host. I say when the person is a host, it can start and stop a clock. Otherwise, no. And then you say how much time is the link going to be valid. And then you get a link that you send to that person. Person can click on the link, log in, for example, in that case with GitHub, and then is added as an authenticated user to static web app. So it's a very nice scenario. In the code, the way that it works is that in my roots.json, and so let me show you here the thing, I have my function applications. Here I decided, and that was probably a bad decision, I decided to split my function application in two. I have one which is part of the static web app, which is authenticated. And then what I have another one, which is the one that the guests are using when they want to just see the clock, but they are not going to interact with the clocks. Um, in, if I had to refactor that, I would probably put everything in the same application, and then I would use different routes. I would have an API one, uh, API slash protected or whatever, and then a, a free API. Now, here the routes, I said, all right, everything which goes to API slash everything is going to have the role of host, all right? So if that person who is authenticated in my application and you only need to authenticate if you want to be a host, right? If that person is authenticated and has the role host, then they can access the functions to start and stop the clocks. Here, you see that you can start a clock, you can stop a clock, you can send a message. Now we have the free part, so the part where you don't need authentication, where you are going to negotiate, remember the negotiate function, it's here. Everybody has to negotiate, right? And a cool thing is that you can also have some upstream. So basically you have some functions here which have a signal R trigger. So the signal R hub can send a message to the function. You know, the, the app server communicates with the signal R, but signal R can also communicate with the app server. For example, when you have a connection or a disconnection, you, you actually get notified. And then after that, you can tell all your web clients, oh, I have one user less, I have one user more, if you want to keep track of your clients. Here, in the client, this is exactly the same than before, except it's in C-sharp. It's using Blazor, so it's a web assembly. So what do we have here? We have um, here the, uh, let me show you here. We have the negotiate URL, which is my slash negotiate function. Here I'm using an HTTP request. Before I did that with Axios in JavaScript. And then once I have the response, which has the info, the URL, and the token, I'm going to go and I'm going to use a hub connection builder, which this time comes from a NuGet package because it's .NET. And I'm going to use the URL and the token to open the connection. Now, the difference here is that I have a lot more channels. You see, before I only had the, the, the new message channel. Now I have what happens when somebody disconnects, what happens when you start a clock, what happens when you stop a clock, what happens when, you, when the, the host decides to update the name of the session, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so you can configure that. So if I demo that, I'm almost at the end. Let's go to hello world the timekeeper.cloud. I'm going to log in. Here, I already logged in before because I wanted to make sure that everything was working. But essentially, I would, it would ask me to go and log in to GitHub. OK. And now, let's open here the session that I use for .NET Conf. What I can do is go and add a new clock. I can configure it. Give it a name. I can see what happens. That's going to happen to me in exactly two minutes. Stop talking, OK. I can say, what is the countdown? What is the color it's going to show when it counts down? After two minutes, I'm going to say what color it should be. After, when it only remains 30 seconds, what color it should be. And then, oh, it's a small bug that I have where sometimes you need to refresh. Uh, and then I have here a URL for the client. So for the client, I'm going to tell everybody who's a guest on my show, I'm going to tell them, use this URL here to go there. All right. Now, this is a client view. They don't need to authenticate. And if I go and start the clock, notice that I have one peer. You see that the clocks are synchronized. As a host, I can go and remove time or add time to the people as I want. When I reach two minutes, it turns yellow. When I reach 30 seconds, it turns red. 
And then when I reach zero, which is almost what's happening to me, it's going to start blinking and say stop talking. So basically you are able to give some messages to the user. You can also say hello and send them some indications. Very useful application built exactly with the same principles that I just showed you. All right, so I'm at the end of this presentation. If you want to know more about everything we talked, I'm going to give you the slides, all right? I'm going to just go quickly through the summary, but essentially we talked about the past and we talked about the present. Uh, on Microsoft.com slash learn, we have learning paths where you can learn how to use web services like that, uh, Signal R services, Azure Functions. Again, I'm going to give you the slides, so don't worry about the QR code right now. Introduction to ASP.core.net Signal R. And if you go to this URL, that's where you get the slides all the resources and everything you need, all right? So I want to thank you so much for your attention. My name is Laurent Bunio. I'm a cloud advocate for Microsoft. I'm going to be here the whole day, but right now I have another session, so I'm going to run to it. If you want to catch me later after my next session, please come and talk to me, and I'd love to see your phone and understand what went wrong, okay? Thank you so much for your attention, and have a fantastic day in Oslo and on the stream. Thank you. <laughs>